Okay, well, welcome everyone. That's my cue. I just want to say welcome to the Blanchard um, webinar here for navigating diversity, equity, and inclusion in Singapore. So I just want to say hello and welcome you all. My, I am Derek Ma. I am the country manager here for Blanchard in Singapore. And I, I am honored to have you all here, but I am super excited because today we have a very special guest with us. So I'm going to introduce you, Angel, first, because I just want everyone to know who you are, and I'm going to sing your praises. Um, Angel is our guest here today, Angel Killian and she is a director at Include Consulting. Um, Angel designs and implements DNI strategies for organizations across the Asia Pacific market and beyond. Before Include, Angel led talent development, recruitment, and L&D teams in companies such as WeWork, PageUp, and Spencer Ogden. She has been recognized as LinkedIn's top voice for gender equity and company cultures. She blogs, she speaks, she trains, and she also coaches. Um, and she's trained by ICF coaching, just like I am. So she is a DNI uh, DEI expert, and I am so happy that Angel is here. A Angel, how are you doing? Very good. Very excited to be here. Thanks, Derek. Hey, and also I, better than I could have introduced myself. Hey, you know, because, you know, it, it, I'm super excited. So as you can tell, and I also want to say that full disclosure, I haven't met Angel in person. I've only seen her on a kind of rectangle on a screen on my computer, but I've watched a number of her interviews and stuff. And if you want to Google her and see all her stuff, she's got a ton of stuff up there. I highly recommend her. But today, Angel, I would like to ask you, how did you kind of get into this DEI space? Because in my experience, I've met DEI people and usually there's some sort of story or something, but how did you get into this space and why are you so passionate about it? Not going to lie. I think for me as well, it's, it has been a personal story. Now, I think growing up as a brown woman in Singapore, very quickly you realize that there is an in-group and there's an out-group and we're taught from a very young age to navigate it. So I remember even growing up in the school bus, you know, the kids would say stuff like, the reason why your color, the color of your skin is such is because you shower in really hot water. Oh, or that's terrible. People like you have a certain bug in their hair. And at that point, I remember going home and telling my mom about it. And yes, of course, as per every mom, they would step in. But we're often told to just keep our head down, just keep quiet and let's keep going because that's just how the system is. So I grew up with that whole need of, I want to be part of the solution, right? I'm sure there's a place where we can all learn from each other. How do we educate? How do we part of this other solution? And what that wow. then took me was I, I went on a spree of the first 10 years of my career, surprisingly <laughs> hiring people, growing companies. And what I did notice was, yes, we're, we're out there finding the best people, but there's always comes a place on how do we then include them to get the best out of them, which yeah. is when also things like Black Lives Matters, Me Too movement came up which was the perfect opportunity to bring my lived experience and my expertise together into diving into DNI. So that's the the short answer of that the past 15 years, I would say. Yeah, I, th I feel like there's a start of a book there, Angel. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, can I, I, I want to share that actually a DEI thing for me that made me so passionate about this is actually uh, in 2019, I got my first corporate training gig um, from a company that needed to hire someone that was not uh, six over 60 and, and white male. Mm -hmm. So... They actually expressed to me, we need someone who is not like us. And so would you come okay. on board with us? And I thought, sure. I didn't, I was quite surprised that they were so forward in it, but I guess because it was a, a, a British company, they were very honest in saying, we're not very diverse and we need you to come on board. And that really opened me up to this concept of, wow, we really do need to consider these things because they were working for an American company and the American company said, we noticed all of your trainers are mm. a particular type of person. And they gently said, can you please uh, change that? And so they and, did. Yeah. And I think, you know, Derek, what you're saying, there's beauty in that, right? There's beauty in companies acknowledging and realizing, hey, I actually this is not what diversity looks like and mm. how can we then consciously bring diversity in? So I have a lot of respect for companies who then realize what can we do ourselves to change that? Yeah, and actually, um, and I think this is apparent, apparent for a lot of people on this call is that this one company in America, it was actually one of their stated values and it wasn't just kind of on their website. It was, hey, we really follow this and we really appreciate it if our vendors had some diversity. And so mm -hmm. I, I really honor that company by taking that stand. And then the company that hired me just was like, 
yeah, actually, we we think you. <laughs> We think we should as well. So that was kind of my start into what I really see uh, as DEI kind of in in a company where it's like it really where the rubber hits the road. Mm. Um, but I, I want to talk more about Singapore for a second because you know this is about yeah. DEI in Singapore. So for Singapore, I've only been here for two years. You obviously grew up here, so you know it a lot better. But uh, you know Singapore is not seen as a DEI kind of hub. Uh, mm -hmm. So can you maybe from your expertise and what you've been doing, can you share some stories or some experiences that you've had that's been like a really positive thing yeah. that's going on in Singapore? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you you mentioned, you know, very traditionally we see Singapore as not as a DEI hub. So I remember when I first, my, my team at Include and I, when we first started writing about DEI on LinkedIn, we would get so much of backlash because oh, people yeah. would say, DEI is a Western concept. It's not applicable mm. in Asia. Or it's not applicable in Singapore, which really pushed us to then contextualize our content, but also at the same time, show how this is relevant, especially yeah. in Singapore. Definitely. To your point, we've actually seen a lot of very um, encouraging, I think, solutions, initiatives, what you call it. I think two things, right? One is even looking at the st stance the government is taking in the media now, you very often see education on about how we should look at power, privilege, microaggression, how to be an ally for each other. We have had a lot of our clients in Singapore, especially look at how do I increase gender um, representation at the executive level? Mm. How do I be conscious of my policies, my practices that includes both men and women and all genders? So I would definitely see that we've been seeing a lot of encouraging um, steps taken. On that note though, uh, you know, like how you were saying, especially in Singapore, what we've also seen is there's a huge push to contextualize solutions specifically for Asia and Singapore. Very traditionally, how a lot of your larger organization, there might be a global strategy, but mm. what we've seen is that global strategy doesn't always work in Asia. Mm. That to contextualize is ever more important. What about yourself? Have you seen um, more of this in Singapore? Uh, I... You know, again, I've only been here for the last two years and I've been training here and talking to people. And it's definitely something that's being talked about more, but yeah. whether the organization is doing anything is another thing. So mm -hmm. diversity DEI is being is a very strong buzzword right now. And obviously mm -hmm. we're in Pride Week right now. So there's I'm Pride Month. So there's a lot of discussion. But in terms of an initiative or program, I'm not yeah. seeing as much, but I will celebrate um something that I heard recently. Um a few weeks ago, uh, Blanchard, we held a roundtable to just discuss some some of this DEI stuff. And we had a uh, Lisa Chang who came from Mandai, one of the VPs for HR there. And she shared one of the initiatives that they're doing. And Mandai is doing some amazing DEI initiatives. But um, she shared that uh, when it comes to their family members, um, they can claim uh, MC leave. Uh, and I hope I'm getting this right because I think we have some Mandai people here. They can claim MC leave if there's a family member that's sick. So if they're taking care of a family member, so it's not just me, myself and sick, okay. um, but I can claim that, which is really great because that's yeah. um, understanding that, you know, certain people need to take care of their loved ones. Um, but the family extends to their furry kids as well in Mandai. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it was, I, I just thought that was so cool because... You know, if you work for Mandai, you're gonna love animals. Um, and it was funny because at the at the round table, we kind of laughed because we thought that that was different. But at the same time, mm -hmm. if I'm a young person and I'm super passionate mm -hmm. about this stuff, that would be an attraction to me yeah. um, as well. So I just thought, you know, there was a definite kind of ha 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 moment. But then I was like, really sitting there going, that's really forward thinking, and I, I think that's really yeah. cool. No, I agree because. Families come in all shapes and sizes, right? What I mm. think of a family could be very different to somebody else. And if we're talking about inclusion, that includes people of all backgrounds and all starting points also. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I'm American. So when you say DEI, my mind does not immediately go to furry, you know, children. You know? <laughs> but uh, I celebrated that because I thought yeah. that was just really, really cool and, and very forward and something that I just thought, wow, and I'm so glad I got to hear what, what they're doing. So for me, that's encouraged. But then what I've also seen is that companies, there, there's a desire, Angel, and I'm sure you've seen mm -hmm. this um, and include, is that companies want to do something. Um, yeah. And then, but they're still kind of like, Ooh, you know, they don't want, there's some yeah. sort of barriers or there's some inertia. So I find that really interesting in Singapore, how we're still at this place of desire, wanting, 
but not yet actioning. And I feel like that's kind mm-hmm. of where you you kind of come in with with include and the stuff that you do. Yeah, I agree. And I think we also have to remember that DI is so new. There's so much of innovation in the space. Even as recent as five years ago, nobody was using the word diversity, inclusion, or equity, right? Mm -hmm. It's such a new buzzword. But at the same time, it can be difficult because even as leaders, we want to do the right thing. We're afraid of getting it wrong. And when we might not have experienced it a certain way, all the more the organization and company might be might be afraid of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Mm. But I think also acknowledging it from a lens of empathy is very important because it's a journey. We're all learning. We're all going through that. And some action is better than no action. So I'd include what we always say is in these moments, it's always best to start with the data. The numbers don't lie. And the only way we're going to get insights if we ask the affected groups and people and your workforce. So we always work with our clients in starting with the data. So it, it could be your employee survey, your onboarding, your retention. All of those numbers give you a lot of insights before you then identify the root cause and create solutions around that. Without that, that's what's going to happen, Derek, where you know, we try and throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. And that yeah. makes us more nervous because we have nothing to measure or nothing to back up why we're doing something. I hope that helps. Yeah, I mean, I I sat through one of the uh, webinars that Include does, and I was quite, I thought that was really cool how you go in and do like a really good comprehensive, a lot of research, you do a lot of numbers, and you really try and back it up with with, um, kind of, you're benchmarking where they're at, and then you're really showing where you can take them. So I thought that was just really cool that, that Include does. And I think it's important because if you're going to say that, a DEI, a DEI initiative is going to do something in this company, well, kind of, you need to prove it, right? And I feel yeah. like that's a really good thing that you all do. Yeah. And everything that we do is evidence-based and data-driven. So that's where a lot of where we want to be, where where the reality of your situation and where you want to go, the data doesn't lie on that. Yeah. And I feel like, um, well, you know, and this might be a bit sensitive, but I was just wondering, are you able to talk about DEI initiatives or or maybe where diversity wasn't being mm. observed and there was significant issues here. And I'm, I'm not sure if you can share anything that's sensitive, but. I wouldn't say in specifically in terms of DNI not working, but when we look at, um, when clients come to us and we first look at it, it always comes back to two key things, right? And things that we've spoken about. One is when we're not looking at the data and we're not looking at the insights and just trying things for the sake of without knowing, And a lot of times these solutions are not evidence-based. So there's no evidence that these solutions work. So picking those kind of solutions are not setting us up for success that way. So that's one, looking at evidence-based solutions. Number two is having a strategy, Mm -hmm. right? With the strategy, we then know what's going to work specifically for the organization. But when we don't have that, that's when things start to also backfire. And the third one to your earlier point, Derek, is... How Asia and Singapore works is very different to the rest of the Western world, right? Mm. Even when we look at the research in terms of power distance, countries like Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, they're very different from the US, Australia, um, and the UK, from the Western countries. So when we talk about things like psychological safety, well-being, diversity, inclusion, how that gets implemented as solution in Asia is not something that we can just take from from the US and implement it. Yes. So I think that's when a lot of that disconnect happens. Um, mm. And that's when we we feel that, you know, it, it's a wide, it's a big investment. We want to get it up for success, but thinking of it from those lenses are equally important. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I I experienced something here and I'm going to share something that's in the public domain. It's it's all yeah. over uh, the news, words, but there's a, a situation that happened with Ubisoft uh, Singapore. And so this was a few years ago where there was an accusation from a number of staff there that there was a glass ceiling for local Singaporeans Mm -hmm. um, and and that local Singaporeans were not being um, allowed to or uh, being given the senior management positions. Um, And also there was accusations of kind of harassment and and Mm -hmm. these types of things. Now, I want to caveat this by saying there was an investigation into um, Ubisoft Singapore and they were cleared of all of this. Mm. So officially they were cleared. However, these these accusations 
And all of that was reported in all of these websites. It's on Straight mm -hmm. Times, it's on Mothership, and then it was all these gaming sites. And so now Ubisoft Singapore has had to do this incredible kind of damage control mm -hmm. to ensure that they um, highlight that they are working in this area in terms of uh, D DEI. But just the accusation did so mm -hmm. much damage to the reputation, it, even though they were cleared of all this. Yeah. Um, they 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 carry this reputation whether they earned it or not and i just think it's really crazy how right now in this day and age of social media and singapore this i'm learning what this whole stomp thing is where people just like <laughs> take pictures and like publicly shame people and i just feel like wow in this day and age if you get even accused of this stuff it's it's going to be very damaging for you yeah. or your company and so i feel like wow for, for anyone here who's here who's wondering should we do this should we even consider this um, it's a strong consideration, I, I would say, that that you should. Um, yeah. I think it's almost to add to that, the risk of not engaging in DEI is far greater because mm. it affects your, your innovation, your brand reputation, your um, ability as an employer of choice, especially as talent. You know, when we look at the generation now, DEI is such a big thing for them in considering who am I going to choose to work for? Yeah. So I do think the risk of not engaging in it is far greater too. Uh, okay, so you talked a lot about you know numbers and data, but I I I want to just talk about this because this always comes up whenever I talk to business leaders about this. So, can DEI lead to profitability, or is it just something that I have to do a nice to have for my younger talent to keep them happy, or is it actually can it actually do anything to my bottom line? Yeah. So I will tap on the research and I'll give you an example. Okay. All so right. the, the research on this is very solid. McKinsey has released multiple papers. BCG also has a couple on this. But when we look at companies with um who are have above average diversity in their teams, their revenue from innovation is 19 points higher than companies that don't. Let's bring it a bit closer to home when we look at gender and ethnicity diversity, right? When we look at ethnic diversity, companies in the top quartile uh, outperform companies in the lower quartile by 36% in financial performance, which is a direct impact to your bottom line and the revenue as an organization. And those are the numbers. But when we look at actual case studies, when you engage in not just diversity, right? You can have a diverse pool of people, but they also need to be in an environment where it's inclusive as you and I, even as in individual, we're going to feel safer to throw in our ideas, different perspectives, psychological safety is high, which then helps us problem solve better, right? Which helps us create new products, ship out to market much faster as well, which are all benefits to the wider organization. And I'm not saying this is something that's going to be overnight. We've yeah. seen from the numbers in the case studies, it, it is a change of behaviors and personalities and org structures. And that does take time. And that does take the investment to get there. But what we see is when we do get there, the return, the ROI is substantial though. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to highlight this. Uh, McKinsey, McKinsey do a whole big thing on DEI. So if you wanted to know more about this, I highly suggest just type in McKinsey DEI and you'll see a lot of resources there. And they've been doing this since I think 2015, they've had articles mm. back to. So they've really done a lot of research on it. Now, granted, it does lean a little bit towards Western stuff. However, those numbers that um, Angel shared are absolutely the now the kind of DEI standard because they did some good research on this. 36% outperforming is, is no joke. And what people tend to think of as DEI as a fad or like, we'll just do it to, to appease the young people. But what we're seeing more and more is this, this actual change or increase in profitability. I love that you mentioned the speed to market because this, this concept that you could be more creative with a group that's more diverse, just saying it, you think, of course, <laughs> right? Because if you have a diversity in some sort of strategic thinking or creative thinking, looking for solutions, of course, having diversity. Now, whether p companies do that or not is another question. And I love that Angel was talking about this because if, if you don't go in this direction, then and other companies even have something simple. And, and sometimes the DEI initiative or practice could be as little as wanting to have 50% of your um, interview pool to be women. And, and that's not a huge you know, thing that companies do, but it's significant. And that kind of thing can build, I mean, we already know that um, 
that companies and the research has shown that companies with more women executives actually perform 55% better. So there's, <laughs> these are numbers that's out there already. And yet some companies just think, uh, nah, I'll do that next year when there's more profit. And so we're kind of, I'm, I'm kind, we're kind of pushing back on this a little bit that actually there can be a strong bottom line argument uh, for DI initiatives. But I would definitely agree. It's not, it's, it's, I mean, we know it's good for business. It's not the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do even. But at the same time, it's not an easy thing to do, right? Because mm. we are consciously tapping into our unconscious and changing processes and policies to make it equ equitable to everyone. And sometimes we have to do the hard thing because that's what's going to get us the result. I, I had a specific story. So I've always worked for very fast-paced moving organizations and um. I've, I've been in situations where, you know, unconsciously to me, I, I never knew that diversity was an element that we should look at when we recruit and hire people. And when I compare that experience as an individual with the include that I work with now, every one of us comes from very different backgrounds, but we were very intentional with that. So mm -hmm. even when we go out to recruit and hire for people, we specifically said, let's look at the ratio of our team. What is going to be a diverse perspective in this team? And I will admit in the early days, it was difficult because everyone has such a different perspective. You're trying to understand how to work together. Yeah. That is the difficult part, right? But once you ace that, you get so, we outperform so many of our competitors because I would say a lot of it is the, our knowledge and the diversity of that team. But mm -hmm. it is difficult, but it does pay off. Yeah, I mean, when I when I bring this back to Singapore, mm -hmm. I, I, I noticed just even getting off the plane from Hong Kong and also, you know, being American, that there is such a diversity in this country, that there's so many great, it's like a, it really is like an Asian melting pot, I, I feel. Um, and then just the ability for so many different religions and, and nationalities and races to be kind of together. I just think it's it's awesome here. But then, like you said, when you were growing up, it's kind of sometimes there is a bit of a segregation in that sense here. So when you do these initiatives or when you kind of doing these kind of things, the DEI things in companies, do you how do you deal with that uncomfortableness or those biases that that will uncover when you when you kind of do like a workshop or or engagement with a company surely you're kind of coming up against some deeply ingrained um you know cultural and just environmental biases towards or yeah. against people how do you deal with that yeah i think one thing that i've learned through my own journey as a dni practitioner is our goal is not to shift everyone's mindset we can't change everyone and you have to be okay with that mm -hmm. because people come from different backgrounds and sometimes that journey for different people looks very different um so through the years i've i've learned ways and equipped myself with tools on how i can navigate those unconscious bias and the reality is we all have unconscious bias we're all humans as long as we have a brain we have biases right <laughs> But how do we navigate through that? But when I personally face those biases myself, I do remind myself that it's not my job to change everyone's values and belief system or, or how they see the world. Um, but in reality, when I look back at all my facilitation experience, people are coming into these sessions with the intent of, I know I have unconscious bias. What can I do to become better? So you'd actually mm. be shocked. I've never had any of those instances in any of my training or my workshop because they're coming in with the intent and signaling that I'm not good at this, but I want to get better at this, oh, right? Nice. You could be someone who's part of the majority and you might have privilege, but that doesn't make you a bad person, mm. right? We know that with that privilege, we can be an ally. So I think oftentimes, especially in Singapore, this concept of having privilege it, it it's it's starting to almost shape it and make it look like it makes you a bad person if you have a, you're part of the majority or your privilege, which is not true. It just in every country, every place, there's majority and minority. It just means that being part of the majority, you have privilege that you can use for the greater good. Yeah, I feel like um, there is a shift happening now mm -hmm. in Singapore, and I feel like there's there's definitely an understanding that. I think there was a kind of forced integration <laughs> in the in Singapore's history, but I feel like now, at least in when I, when we work with uh, large companies, because um, that's the context we have with Blanchard and Momenta, there is an understanding that you know together, you know, just to have this understanding and empathy, there's more language around, 
you know, how to express oneself and how to understand someone mm -hmm. else. I feel like more than ever, there's just an understanding that I should and I can try and understand rather than yeah. you do you and I do me kind of like, yeah. you know, and, and that's really cool, at least from my understanding and my observation. Yeah. It's, I it's definitely cool. agree. You know, but I, when I think of Singapore, I think, okay, and, and you mentioned something that I want to touch on, because again, I want to stay in the Singapore context. You said that there's a lot of contextualization that you do for Singapore. What do you mean by that? Um, if something's coming from global, because we know we have a lot of multinationals here that have a DNI from global, which is maybe from the US or Europe, and then it's contextualized. What, what do you mean there? Um, I think a few different things, like say, for example, um, perhaps an initiative around Black Lives Matter or um, mm. yeah, maybe if we take a Black Lives Matter initiative and contextualizing it for Asia, it might not be as um, relevant because of the, the ethnical makeup in yeah. the country. So then how, if we're talking about race or if we're trying to get more ethnic diversity into the leadership, how can that be contextualized specifically for Singapore? Mm. So, you know, contextualizing it in, in the sense that it's reflective of the Singapore lens. It's reflective of um, the, key, the key areas of concerns that organizations want to face in, in Singapore. Another example that I could give you is um, gender and race. So perhaps in a lot of the Western countries, you might be trying to get more diversity into your leadership teams versus, and that could look at um, race, that could look at ethnic groups. And that in Singapore, perhaps because of the different makeup of the groups in Singapore, that might actually focus more on gender diversity into your mm. leadership so mm -hmm. ensuring the contextualizing of that is very important. Perhaps even looking at flexible work policies, right? In in Singapore, like you mentioned, even having the policies extending to the fur babies or a huge part of having an aging population in Singapore is that sandwich yeah. generation where a lot of adults are expected to care for their elderly families and elderly parents. So how do we contextualize policies to be inclusive of that? versus that might be something that is not an expectation or relevant in the Western world. So mm. I think putting in the lens of what are the cultural norms and the nuances in Asia, but at the same time looking at what are consistencies that we can still keep. Yeah, and I, and I feel like, Angel, like your experience here is really is valuable just because DEI cannot be copy and pasted from the West here. That's just not going to work. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, 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 you know, obviously again, and I, and I self-disclose this a lot as an American, are we, are we avoiding some conversations here in Singapore? Are we just not ready for some conversations? But at the same time, I'm realized it's not my place to say, Hey, let's talk about this DEI concept because I'm the loud American sometimes. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, like, do you find that you are, um, educating in the sense of maybe we should talk about some of these things or do you do a bit more observing and reacting to what the um to what the kind of company culture is or what's happening around yeah. you meaning like are you taking a stance to be like no we should talk about this because this is what's happening this is what di is or are you doing a little bit more kind of listen and reacting yeah so i would say i'd include we we have to meet our clients where they are at mm -hmm. right and different clients are at different points of their journey. But at the same time, them investing in us is also because they know something needs to be fixed. And our role as consultants is go there and bring them on that journey. But that doesn't mean that we go in and be like, we have to talk about this. This is mm. the right thing to do. We also have to meet them, have that lens of empathy and call out things that they might not see because that's where we are the experts on. So perhaps is a hiring process, a recruitment process or certain policies that are not inclusive of different groups, but it, it, it might not be something that they're not talking about because they don't know what they don't know. And mm. that's where as DNI experts, we come in to shape that conversations. Also, sometimes because we're external consultants, it's easier for us to have that conversation, right? <laughs> it's easier for us to bring that up and preface and we have the right verbatim to have those kind of conversations. And I think it's also um, how you have the conversation and when you have the conversation. We're not going to be in the first meeting telling you what's wrong, but also mm. looking at, you know, now that I have the data and the insights and the conversations that I've had with the various stakeholders, here are some of the things that what 
these insights are telling me. And from there, yeah. supporting it to have that conversation. I think that was one of the things that stood out when I was kind of watching you on some of the stuff that you have online and then also in the webinar that um, there are some DI people, experts who have a certain agenda to push. I want you to talk about this and you have to be this if you're going to be diverse or if you're going to be inclusive, it has to include that, which to me is not the way forward. And that's why I appreciate kind of how you how you ought to include and how you personally are, Angel, and, and how you conduct yourself as a DI expert. So I really appreciate that because if you're pushing an agenda, I think that's going to leave a bad taste in people's mouth. Yeah. Um, and it's going to do DEI as a whole uh, industry. It's not doing any favors. Yeah, we all have very different experiences, right? But I think at the end of it, at the, at the start of the journey, as we build credibility and, and establish ourselves, it's important we meet clients where they're at. Yeah, no, I think that's so good because, because we a lot of times that initial conversation with a client, and for us, you know, it's leadership, but when it comes to DI, it's a little bit more sensitive, you know, and a lot of what I've started to talk with some companies about, when you start talking about DI, they're almost like, a bit shy or a bit ashamed or they're a bit embarrassed, you know, and so to, to really be yeah. okay with where they're at and say, that's okay. It's fine. Yeah. You know? um, and not be like, oh yeah, you're terrible. You know, your DEI levels are, you know, it's, yeah. it's not, which, not like that. Which actually, if you think about it, goes against everything that DNI is about, right? We want to be <laughs> inclusive. We want to create the equity. We want to create that psychological safety and safe space. Um, so I think definitely recognizing that we're all on a journey and there's so much of innovation that goes on in this space. I learn something new each day. Hmm. Um, when you mentioned psychological safety, I remember something that came out recently on Mothership and, and there's a few polls that were done and Singapore ranks as one of the highest in terms of workplace bullying. Um, so I, I wonder what you, uh, and, I, and I, didn't, I didn't prepare this for you, but I just want your initial thoughts on this kind of sense of, you know, it, like Singapore is known to be a hardworking place, but then it's known it's one of the top three in this poll in terms of workplace mm. bullying. So I wanted, I wanted to know your initial thoughts on this. I wonder why, huh? I remember reading an article recently about power distance in different countries. Mm -hmm. And Singapore actually ranked one of the highest when it came to the power in, um, power distance index. Yeah. Could it also possibly be, I think one thing is hierarchies in Singapore, right? In, in this part of the world, Hierarchies are still very much in, in order, even with the sandwich generations, hierarchy, all of that affects psychological safety too, Yeah. right? So I think there's definitely something to think about, definitely something that I want to think about. Maybe I'll come back to you on it, but there's a, a threat of the Asian nuances, how we've, the messages we've heard growing up, um, but also how we see power distance. So how yeah. psychological safety could be in Asia could be very different to other parts of the world. And I wonder mm. whether that has a, a link to that poll that you saw. Yeah, and I just really, I, I'm, I understand that obviously doing something like national service is an honor. And of course I would never speak out against it publicly on a recorded webinar, but um, I feel that there's this real, um, you know, there's an understanding of, of position here in Singapore because of the military training. And I think in many ways, it serves the country well. Sometimes in a workplace though, those can be a little bit um, kind of molded into like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, you're my boss, but are you my commander type of deal? Um, mm. And we're see, and I have personally coached someone here in Singapore of, you know, how do I deal with a boss who treats like our, you, our team as like a military unit? Wow. Um, which is like, you know, in some ways it's good because it's productive, it's efficient, but at the same time, it's like, well, this is not, you know, yeah. we're not in the army, this is a company, yeah. so. I'm curious to know what the attrition rates would be, right? Whether people actually stay in roles where. Yeah, I don't have that data, but I just, yeah. I just, oh man. Um, Whether they need to stay in these roles. I don't think people would stay for a long time in these roles, though, when they, when they feel that psychological safety is low. So um, I, I, you touched on this and you mentioned this earlier, and, and this leads into my next question for you. There is a, a generation gap in terms of DEI. So um, uh, Angel, for those of you on the call, Angel mentioned a poll that there is, you know, DEI is being kind of seen as more important. So Gallup did a poll in 2008 and they looked at what do the gen different generations look for? Um, when they are looking for a company to work for. So if you look at Boomer, Gen X, uh, 
Gen, you know, Gen Z now. Yeah, no. Well, now the the high school people are Gen Alpha. I found out today. Okay. Okay. So they're basically okay. that's the next one. So boomers, for them, it was kind of they want um, financial stability. They want a number of things, but DEI was not on the list. And zoom forward to now, the youngest generation now that's in the workforce now getting into leadership, they have DEI as one of the top three. Mm -hmm. So there is this sense of like, okay, the older generation, it wasn't even on their radar. Now for the younger generation that's going into management now, it's now becoming one of the top three things that they're looking for in a company. So how do you as a company bridge this gap for, especially for companies and especially because Singapore is an aging yeah. country, how do you bridge that gap within companies? I think one is regardless of which generation you're in. The research is very, very solid, right? When we all feel included, we perform better, the companies do better. Mm. But again, one, like you said, in that boomer generation, things like DNI or DEI, they were never spoken about. It's not something mm. that was top of mind. People never had these conversations to start with as well. Yeah. Yeah. And even in my generation and these the new generation now, they see the impact of DNI, right? They see why it's important and they've seen firsthand the benefits to them and their career. And there's two things we can do here. One is we can choose not to engage. We can choose to keep going on, on the way we want to go with. And we decide, you know, DNI is perhaps only for certain types of companies and it doesn't matter here. But the risk with that is you're going to lose talent, you're going to lose innovation, brand identity, and market share, which all affects your financial performance. Yeah. So it's almost the risk of not engaging is far too high. Mm. to continue doing business if we don't get on board but at the same time with organizations and you're going to find different generations and this is only going to get heightened as we go on we have to find a way to bring them along on the journey right yeah when we mean inclusiveness that includes them too so how do we navigate these conversations for for even even if you might find employees who are not bought into the idea who don't see the benefits of it right it could be you know, someone the other day said, oh, this is just too woke for me. Like, what's <laughs> happening? You know, this is just too woke for me. But I think where we found it useful is that include what we do when we see multiple generations is we start with listening to them, really understanding what is it that makes yeah. them nervous? You know, what is it that, that they don't understand? A lot of times, there is a cause for that discomfort. Mm -hmm. There is a reason why they feel that way. It could be the competitiveness. It could be, you know, as we get older, it is scary to see how things are changing so much around us, right? I feel that I, I'm not, I don't consider myself old, or at least I like to think so, but I feel that way sometimes, <laughs> right? Like even I feel that way sometimes. So I think really listening with the intent to understand the empathy, showing them the benefits, but also finding a way for them to, to be on board and feel included. So really bring back the benefits to them. The benefits to the boomer generation and to these mm -hmm. other generation we find has been really impactful in bringing the organization together. Yeah, um, I, I, when you share that story there, it kind of reminds me of a time when I did something like this. But what I found was to bridge that gap, whether it's DI or whatever, to sit down and have a facilitated conversation um, and just telling them or teaching them how to take turns to listen and share. And, and like you said, listen to understand. Mm. These are so key. But then we find that a lot of companies, um, especially large ones, they don't have many opportunities to just sit down and have a non-work meeting yeah. sit down and conversation. And so when they come to like a workshop that maybe we we will facilitate, to have them sit around and maybe a, a have a little discussion on, you know, what's what do they really care about or something they're very passionate about, something that, um, is really impacting them and to practice listening, practice empathy. And then they realize that there's a lot more in common with me, with this person sitting across yeah. than, than what I have all these preconceived or annoyances because of the younger generation or the older, the boomers, right? Um, yeah. But just, uh, and that's one of the things that I love what we do when we facilitate these kind of things is just to get people to sit down. We're not doing KPIs right now. We're just having a conversation. We're listening. We're growing together. We're understanding. And that can really change 
the perception of one generation to the next. Because um, yeah. I do some work in multi-generational um, situations and I always try to get them to sit down and talk about something and to just take turns, don't cut each other off. <laughs> just listen to understand, can you summarize what that person said? And then they go, oh, sorry, I wasn't listening. Oh, can we try again? <laughs> so, but then what comes out of those is something beautiful. Um, and I feel like, yeah, if we could do more of these things, um, and, and I think yeah. Singapore needs to consider these things because it is now considered an aging society, whether, you know, so mm. how do we bridge that gap and how do we ensure that the, the generations are working together rather than the boomers do their thing and we'll do our own thing. Kind yeah, of thing. I don't think that's sustainable. Actually, on that, you reminded me of a story. Every time when we bring in different generations together and we talk about inclusion, we always start with this exercise that gives very interesting insights. We talk about inclusion and exclusion. Mm. Um, whereby you know a time when you felt excluded and you a time when you feel included and it's so powerful because wow. regardless of what generation you're in you have experienced how being excluded feels like and similarly on the other side you you've experienced how being feeling included feels like and we when people actually show share these stories you see why everyone at the core of it wants to feel belong mm. people all want to feel included to tap on your point, I, I totally, I see your point about how as big organizations, sometimes just finding the time to pull everyone together is, that's a big ask itself. And this yeah. is where we've seen um, inclusive leadership plays a huge role. As a leader, a lot of the work that we do with organizations is also then, how do we as include equip leaders to lead inclusively they may know how to lead but how do we then build the psychological safety how do we get them to the difficult part model those inclusive behaviors mm. so that people on the team follow suit and see and this is where also that intergenerational part of things you modeling the behavior gives people around you the safety to do the same yeah that's such an important point because i i, I have been involved in a the I think where basically the senior leaders said, "Oh, just have the young people do it because that's what they want." And so mm. there was there was no inter there was no um, senior leadership representation at the initiative. Oh, um, okay. which was <laughs> which is so important, right? Because it's really sad <laughs> when you don't have the executive leaders or the sponsors and the leaders there. That sends a message to the wider organization that this yeah. is not that by leadership. This is not something that's important to us as an organization. Yeah, and I felt that that was a real miss in terms of what mm -hmm. was trying to achieve. Um, there was another time I was part of an engagement that was really interesting. Um, it was from a, um, a global kind of entertainment company. And in the entertainment industry, most of the executives are, you know, the top executives are men. And so in this one global company, they, the, the women, kind of the senior management, some of the women said, you know what, we want mentorship. We want um, to know, we want guidance and we want mentorship. And so then they developed their own mentorship program that would be exclusively for women, um, which is really interesting. And then in this one global company, it had 100% um, uh, ex uh, execution from the senior leadership. So all the senior leaders, most of them were men, mentored uh, a, 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 f a female in the company. And what was really cool is that this particular company all the women, it was open to anyone who opted in. Okay. So there was some kind of junior executive woman, but then um, there was one woman who who came and she was basically the, the admin assistant who opened the door and received uh, parcels for the office. And she opted in. And so then they they she had a mentor who was like a, a top executive in the company. And I so I <laughs> talked to that executive. Um, I was and, and I talked to her and she said, um, she said it was so great to, to learn how to advance because she wanted to actually advance out of that. Um, and the, the executives did not know she wanted to advance out of that. Mm. So just that conversation uh, gave this, uh, one of the top executives who was her mentor, so much empathy because honestly, he had no interaction with her before this program was initiated. And so I just love that story because um, just the the sitting down and the, these women internally saying, you know, we need something. We're going to go out and find. Uh, we're going to start this internally, um, and then just this understanding that if people just took some time to just sit down and talk to under, understand each other, um, and to talk about, you know, what's what do they want and what what are they feeling and how can they move forward, um, 
I, I just feel like, wow, why, why isn't more companies doing these types of thing and raising the profile of, of, of women and certain stuff? So I, I just, I was really impacted oh. by that one engagement. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Hang on. Oops, I think someone's speaking. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. Thanks for sharing, Derek. That's very interesting. We see that a lot of, um, with a lot of our clients as well, where, you know, when for us to get women into that leadership part of things, that's where we see how sponsorship is so key. Because if we're saying the people in the room currently are all men and they come from similar backgrounds, they look the same, as a woman getting into that table is going to be very difficult. And this is where sponsorship and mentorship plays a role. Getting that mentorship and sponsorship from someone who's already part of that, that interview yeah. is so key in getting that visibility and advocacy. So hey, if anyone's on this call and looking for you know advice or, or suggestions, <laughs> we would love to talk to you. Uh, we're going to move into a time of questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you can unmute. So I'm going to just talk for a few more seconds. I'm going to give Angel one last question. Um, if a company or somebody here who is maybe from L&D or from a company that wants to kind of get started, is not yet doing anything in, in DEI, um, what kind of recommendations or advice would you give them if they want to kind of get started in this uh, uh, for their company? Yeah, my our advice always is if you have not started collecting the data or numbers, start there. And this could be as simple as putting in a question or two in your employee engagement surveys mm -hmm. on inclusion or diversity questions. But before you're going to be able to create any solution, you always want to understand your starting point. And this is by collecting and measuring the data and speaking to groups within the organization to understand what needs to be solved before looking at the various solutions. Yeah, and what um, we also do at Blanchard is what I would like to do is when I when I talk to the senior person, I want to know is, are they doing damage control because something happened, mm. or you know, and you know, I want to get into that information. Yeah. You know, is this because you see an issue and then we're dealing with it, or is it because you, you really do have a kind of a heart and desire to develop this, um, or is this something that you know it's a company value and you just so where is this coming from? This desire yeah. because how we approach if it is like a hey, this something happened, we need you to know. That's totally different than this is a new value for this year, or this is like a, you know, 2023 fiscal year, you know, goal or direction. So uh, I, we, we definitely need to have that uh, conversation first to, to outline, you know, yeah. where is this coming from and where do we want to go? And I love what Angel and, and, and include do is like that, that initial understanding of numbers and understanding of, we have the baseline where that is. So I, I think that's really cool. So uh, I'm going to pause here for some questions, and I know there's a bunch of people here, so if you want to unmute or if you want to drop it in the chat, um, please do so, because I have Angel here for another 10 minutes about. So, um, And as far as I know, if you ask a question, she's not going to charge you her consulting fee. Is that right, Angel? Only for That's... today. Only for the next 10 minutes, Derek. <laughs> okay, okay, I great. You. you get the so, both of us for one. Okay, so uh, I want to encourage you to ask any questions, and please feel free to go ahead and just unmute or or... Uh, put it in the chat. And if not, I'm going to ask questions. So I have a few more, but I'll wait to see if there's any questions coming from the floor. So, okay. Uh, I see a few here in the chat. Let's go down here. Um, Hoi Hoi says, what are, the different, what are the different funding sources available to include people with hearing and visual disabilities at the workplace? Really great question. Hmm. So in, in all complete honesty, I, am, I do not have full visibility of the existing um, funding available. In terms of disabilities, with my work at WeWork, uh, a great place to start would be SG Enable. Let me just put it in the chat. SG Enable. Um, they specifically work with people with different abilities. Um, visual and hearing disabilities, I believe, is one of the key areas. So I would start there. I would definitely start work, uh, speaking with them to see what are some sources available. Okay, Cameron says here, do you have thoughts research on the newer generation Z and alpha thoughts on DEI in Singapore specifically? I feel like most research available online is more with a Western lens. Yeah, I agree. And I and I do think a lot, you know, when we start speaking about DNI, a lot of the research that starts coming out is through that Western led. That being said, I have recently definitely seen more research coming out from Singapore. Just today I was reading about inclusive hiring and how race affects hiring in Singapore and they broke it down to the different 
um, Chinese, Singaporean, uh, a Chinese, Malaysian, so both mm. on ethnicity and race, specifically in Singapore. I found um, looking through the SMU studies, they have very good research lenses, but I would say it's it's as per very different topics as well. I right? put it with your research, with your Boolean, with Singapore and Asia. That has been one of my key ways to find local research. And I find that DEI itself is actually very big. There's a lot of really big kind of things within what DEI is looking at. And mm. so each of these things, there's not actually much data on like specifically for, you know, very specific things. In the, so in Singapore, we have a lot on gender. We have a lot on race. Um and that there's more of that coming out. But when it comes to other parts of inclusion, and we're seeing we're not seeing as much data as possible. Uh, when it comes to differently abled people, uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, you know, there's other things like you know homosexuality and that kind of advocacy. So there's not much data there, I would say, in Singapore. So yeah. we can only tell you anecdotally. Um, but uh, maybe I'll say this to to Cameron. Well, you know, have you talked to a, a Gen Z and Alpha person recently? So I, I, I purposely spoke to someone who's in university just yesterday or a few days ago just talking to them about what do they want and what do they care about and it is more on their minds um angel i don't know how old you are, i won't ask but i'm 43 so when i first started working for a company 20 years ago this was not something that i even thought even cared about um but now there is a question of um you know, how many women do you have in your senior leadership, which is a very normal question to ask yeah. uh, in an interview these days. Very normal, but I would, it would never be asked just, you know, 10 years ago or at least 20, you know. Yeah, 100%. Like even for myself, like it's only probably, I would say three or four years ago that people started asking these questions, which is very reflective of the newer generations coming in, right? Um, but I think it's very necessary questions. And I do think how the Generation Z and Alpha, the way they think about it specifically in Singapore is that it is ever more important. Uh, yeah, so Abilie asking about how our companies in Singapore think about diversity and hiring. I, I've seen a lot more positive hiring practices in terms of gender. Um, so uh, Angel, I don't know what you've seen, mm -hmm. but for me, just hearing that people are, you know, and, and I mentioned it earlier, I believe that some a lot of companies are now saying that, you know, we need to, we need to interview at least, you know, 50% it has to be women. I hear a lot more of that. Beyond that, though, I can't really comment on. So I, I, I would love to know if Angel, have you seen anything? Yeah, would love to hear a little bit more context when you mean diversity hiring. Is it in a certain area, the way they hire, how they hire? Um, a lot of the work that we do at Include when it comes to diversity hiring is, you know, understanding that if we're trying to get diversity in terms of ethnicity, genders, backgrounds, abilities into the organization, then the traditional way of let me just write a job description and post it on LinkedIn no longer works. So it's almost like reverse marketing and thinking of how do I need to show up in my employer branding to increase diversity of candidates in my candidate hiring pool. So we've seen companies, you know, looking at structured interview processes, case studies, looking at how do we design our hiring processes in a way that evaluates skills for the roles rather than past experiences for the mm. roles. So important in equity, right? Um, another thing that we've also seen, I've seen more and more organizations in job descriptions itself declaring salary ranges to be more to for pay transparency. I've seen them put through links where you can connect with different groups if you need um, more support through the interview process. So I definitely see a step forward in more inclusivity in the hiring process. Yeah. Uh, I love this question, and I'll answer it first to give you a little bit of a break, but management is keen on DEI initiatives, but not much well received by employees. And quick tips on how we can drum up interest from less interested employees. Um, I would imagine, Angel, that the initial employee kind of canvassing, finding out what they really want would really help. Um, yeah. So what do you what do you think? Any advice? Any quick tips on to get people interested? I'm less interested. I think you know, 
as an organization, you know, we have a contract with an organization where we work with an organization, right? Mm. And that would also mean treating everyone equally, treating everyone inclusively. That's the contract as, as part of that professionalism side of things. But the reality is we have different lived experiences. We have different value systems. And it doesn't mean one person is wrong or one person is right either. I would say lead with example, them seeing the positive change that comes from inclusion, how people get to do better, how people are happier, how all the benefits of diversity, them seeing it is better than just telling them about it. Mm. I would definitely seek to understand why why are they less interested? What What is it that makes them feel that way? Because if you don't know what's stopping them, you can't work on solving it. Yeah, and I'll, again, I'll mention Mandai because I was so impacted by what they shared at our roundtable. But Mandai do this thing where they... Um, they allow their team members or their, their their employees to decide what type of diversity area they want to advocate for, be a champion for. So rather than management dictating, um, they let their employees decide and then they kind of support and resource that way. So I thought that was a really interesting way of doing it because yes, um, you see a lot of companies say, we are doing this initiative and everybody has to do it. And then everyone's like, well, uh, but then, when you allow for different people to advocate for different things as an employee, then it drums up employee engagement, then it's owned by the employees rather than it's management driven. And so it's a very interesting thing that they have done at Mandai where it's it's um, it's employee driven rather than management driven. And I think um, mm-hmm. it's, it's not something that they advertise externally, uh, but I just thought that was really cool that the management there is, is willing to do that rather than drive a particular agenda or particular focus. Mm. Wow. Yes, uh, I'd love this question because I'm, I'm passionate about this, but I'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, Claudia is asking, expanding on the topic, would you see women empowerment in Singapore as a separate agenda ever, or will it always be part of DEI? Sorry, explaining the topic. Will you see women empowerment in Singapore as a separate agenda or still a part of DEI? So, Claudia, just for context, when you mean women empowerment, do you mean as in um, equal rights for women, women uh, in, in leadership and such? If if I got the context of that question right, then I would say what we're seeing with our clients it is still driven from a diversity angle in DEI. Because at the end of the day, women feeling included and the representation of women on leadership panel, a lot of that KPI still sits with that DEI team. I hope that helped. So, um, no, I don't see it. Uh, we've not seen it as a separate agenda. It still sits part of DEI. All right. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, I personally, yeah, I don't, I don't like that so many things are chucked into the DEI bucket. Um, I think women empowerment should stand alone but then that's just my personal opinion (laughs) why do you say so though curious to hear i I don't know i feel like we i don't want to put everything in one bucket and then what i know some companies do is like every topic goes in the dei and then they have the dei uh employee that handles all that and then we do one thing to be you know, happy about everything. And I feel like that kind of waters down. Um, I feel like women empowerment is actually something that's very, very, there's a lot of research done that when you just have more women in senior leadership or just have more women around the table and you um, have hiring practices that reflect that and, and, you know, advocate for that, your bottom line increases. It's one of the few areas in DEI, of all the DEI things where you can just say without a doubt that the research backs this up. But again, that's my own personal huge conviction there yeah. that um, I think if you're looking, you looking, if you look around the table and it's just men talking, I think you need to take a look at yourselves. <laughs> I 100% support you. I think there's a, there's lots of research and even the economic impacts of it, yeah. right? Women have more money. Um, but I think from the angle, to clarify where I was coming from, is a lot of times you need a certain business unit to take up accountability of these initiatives. Mm. Um, and that's where we see that sitting with the DEI, linking back to you know your leadership goals, your KPIs for, yeah. for some organizations is part of leadership bonus structure and such. But it's still the DEI function that takes accountability for it. 
Uh, honestly, Angel, I could talk with you for a long time, but I do have to draw this to a close as the hour is coming to an end. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your um, questions, but um, let me just share one thing with you all very quickly. And that is for us, for Blanchard, uh, what we are doing, actually, we have just released a DEI one day workshop which basically is, it goes, it was developed with um, Jennifer Brown, who was the author of the book, Courageous Inclusion. And so what we do at Blanchard when we do this one day workshop is to just bring self-awareness where people are at. We don't go in and advocate for any particular um, part of DEI. What we do is that we, we teach people about this concept that you can either be aware of an issue or unaware of an issue, and we can be active on it and to, or be an advocate. And, and so what we do is that we we bring people into this place where they can grow in their empathy and be able to have professional, respectful conversations in this place um, and how to interact with each other in that. So if you want to join our, um, we're actually hosting the Courageous Inclusion Workshop. That's going to happen in July 26th. Um, and there's some information in the chat. But if you would like to, and you're part of the L&D team, um, just contact me directly and then we'll get you in for free. Or if you're thinking about doing a DEI uh, thing for your your organization, we would love to partner with you. Now, of course, you that's just, that's our one day, but if you want to have a more robust conversation about DEI and do the complete um, thing, I would love for you to contact Angel as well, um, and she would have that conversation to benchmark where you're at and to really have a strategic conversation um, with this. So I highly recommend her personally and also include consulting. So that's our information. We'd love to be connected with any of you. And again, if you have any more questions, if you want to reach out to us, our contact is on, on QR, reach out to us on LinkedIn. If not, I want to make sure I honor everyone's time and to say thank you so much for attending. Angel, it has been an honor to spend this last hour with you. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everyone. Thank you again for attending and we will see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. And if you would love to, please reach out. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Really great to have the afternoon with you. And thank you, Angel. You're most welcome. I'll see you soon. Yep.